Today we will be finishing up our study in the book of Psalm and number 23. So turn to Psalm 23. And we'll be looking at the last two verses of this uh, most famous of Psalms. And as you get there, I want you to consider this question. What are the blessings of God? What are the blessings of God? And when I ask that, I want you to think through, you know, are the blessings of God something material? Are they physical things? Are there things that we can uh, see and touch and taste, handle? Are they things immaterial? Uh, that is, are they things that we can't see or touch? Uh, are they some mix of both or are they only one thing and not the other thing? Are they for now? Are the blessings of God given to us in the scripture, the promises of God that we will be blessed by him, are these things ours now? Should we be upset if we don't have them now? Or are they things that will come to us later? And again, is it all or nothing? Are they all now or none of them are now? Or is it some mixture of both? Well, as we come to our scripture this morning, we're going to ask the question, well, what does David say? What does David write under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? What does he write that are the blessings of God that are his? And today I want us to see in our passage that the Lord richly blesses his people now and for all eternity. The Lord richly blesses his people now and for all eternity. So if you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word. And I'll read for us uh, the whole of Psalm 23, uh, though we'll just be looking at verses 5 and 6. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Please be seated. This is the word of God unto us today. And remember, this is a psalm of David, so this was written by David. And we don't know exactly the context in which he has written this. And what I mean by that, we don't know if this was written perhaps during the time uh, when David was being pursued by King Saul uh, in the wilderness, uh, when Saul was trying to kill David. Or we don't know if this is sometime during David's rule and reign as king during a time of peace when he was in his kingdom and secured. Verses 1 through 4 are thematically about shepherd and sheep, right? We, we begin that. The Lord is my shepherd, uh, which makes us the sheep, uh, the ones whom David is, is talking about. David himself, he calls himself here, right? A sheep. The Lord is my shepherd. And the, we see that the Lord provides for his people, right? He provides the good things. Uh, again, verse 1, I shall not want uh, green pastures, still waters. And in 3 through 4, we see that the Lord leads, right? He leads his people. He restores them. He refreshes them. He gives them what they need, and he leads them in right paths or paths of righteousness. Even when those paths go through uh, dark, deep valleys, when we think that death is close, the Lord is there leading us, always. And so, as we see that, I said that's a background to our verses 5 and 6 today, um, we'll see a little bit of a shift as we examine these verses closer from this idea of shepherd and sheep to that of host and guest. And so let's see first in verse 5, the blessings before the world. The blessings before the world in verse 5. And again, we see a slight shift here in the theme. You prepare a table before me 
in the presence of my enemies. Um, and I just say there seems to be a shift in theme here because sheep don't sit at tables. Uh, we do know dogs sit at tables because sometimes they play poker. Right? There you go. If you know that famous painting, uh, there you have it. But sheep don't sit at tables. And so uh, the idea seems to be in these latter verses that God is host, that God is a host, and that we are his invitee. We are his guests. Uh, we are there uh, to, uh, to be with him. And notice that the host serves. And so what does it mean that God is a host? Well, he has certain duties to his guests, right? A, a host has certain responsibilities to their guests. A host has to prepare for their guests, right? A host has to prepare for them. Uh, it never, you never quite feel like you are a uh, welcomed guest when the host is like, Oh, hold on. Let me go. Like, I, let me go make your bed real quick. Let me let me go get that room. There's a lot of stuff on the bed. Let me take that all off. Let me, uh, I actually haven't gone to the grocery store let, yet, so uh, I'm gonna go do that real quick. If you want to stay here, I'm gonna just go to the grocery store and get some things, right? If if you were had planned to show up at someone's house, they've invited you, they've known about it, and you show up and nothing is ready. Would you feel like a valued guest? You'd feel like an afterthought, right? You'd feel like, well, am I really welcome here? So a, a host's duty, one of the host's responsibility is to prepare. We know this God does. Uh, Christ certainly does this in John 14, verses 1 through 3. Uh, John 14, 1 through 3, Christ tells us that he goes to prepare a place for us. And if he's going to prepare a place, he's going to return to gather us. So that where he is, we may be with him always. And so Christ prepares for us. And again, there's intentionality here. Uh, notice in verse 5, you prepare a table before me. Uh, the uh, NET version says you prepare a feast before me. And this, this is the idea here. You prepare a feast. These aren't cast-offs. These aren't scraps. These aren't leftovers. God doesn't go to his heavenly refrigerator, open up and say, what do I have from the past week that I can pull out here and serve you? No, this is an intentionally prepared feast, a bountiful feast. And again, as a host has responsibility to prayer, a host has responsibility for provision, right? And again, food is part of that. What's interesting is in Psalm 78, which uh, we looked at in in the first week when we were looking at verses 1 and 2. But Psalm 78, this is a, a psalm of Asaph. And it describes and it kind of goes through Israelite history. And when you get to verses 18 and 19, notice this. And I just think it contrasts uh, well with our passage in Psalm 23. So Psalm 78, 18 and 19. Uh, yet they still sinned, uh, sorry, they tested God in their heart, verse 18. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God saying, can God spread a table in the wilderness? Can God spread a table in the wilderness? And you know what David says? You prepare a table before me. Where? In the presence of my enemies. You give bountifully. You provide bountifully for me, even in the face of my enemies. David understood what the Israelites in the wilderness didn't. God blesses his people. Uh, we know there, when, when they ask, uh, when Asaph is saying that, can, can God make a table? Can God prepare a table in the wilderness that we know if we go back to the book of Numbers, uh, we'll see how uh, the people again and again, uh, or we could look at Exodus or Deuteronomy, uh, any of the Pentateuch. We can see God uh, where again and again, the people said of God, you've led us out here to kill us. We're hungry. We're thirsty. We're going to die. 
He also, we see in Psalm 23, he doesn't just provide food. The host provides oil and provides anointing oil for his head. Uh, this is something that maybe doesn't make so much sense to us because generally we don't go to someone's house and say, where's the oil? I'd like to anoint my head. Uh, but understand that this is a, we're a different culture, right? But culturally, you would go to a, a, a house, you would go to someone else's house, and part of hospitality would be to give you something to refresh you, to make you feel refreshed. Um, so again, kind of get this idea today in our... I, I, Excuse me. Today in our day, we would say we would go to our um, our house that we're visiting, and the host would provide for us a way to freshen up. So maybe we go to the bathroom, and there's little toiletries there that we can use to freshen up, uh, little soaps or something to make us feel after a long travel more like a human, and less like a gross person that's been sitting in a car for all day, right? Right? There's nothing better than that first shower after driving long distance of like you can just wash off even though you've not done any work, right? You haven't been outside sweating. You've probably been bopping along, listening to the radio with the AC blasting on you, but still there's like it just washes away. And that's this is the idea of this refreshing. Um, we contrast that with uh, we know this is something that uh, that was expected of hosts in Luke 7. Verse 46, Jesus speaking, Luke 7, 46, You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. And they're uh, talking about Jesus as he's visiting somewhere, right? You didn't, you didn't do your basic duty as a host. You didn't, you didn't fulfill that basic responsibility of giving me something to refresh myself with. You say I'm an honored guest, but you've failed to do this basic responsibility. So God provides oil, and we also see that God provides the cup, right? My cup overflows. My cup overflows. You provide drink. Again, we have a contrast to this with uh, the story of Christ in the wedding at Cana in John 2. Uh, remember the situation there is that during this wedding feast, the host's responsibility is what? Provide drink for his guests. And what has the host failed to do? Provide sufficient drink for his guests. The wine is run out. There's a, there's a panic. And so Jesus' mother says, Jesus, help out. And Jesus does. And then, of course, we remember uh, the end of that in which the servant says, you know, most hosts save, uh, you know, give the good wine at first and save the bad wine for the end. But you've given us superior wine at the end. And how great is that? You've, you've su surpassed your, your responsibility as a host. This is essentially what that ends up as. But so provision, uh, things to refresh us, food, drink. We expect that out of our hosts when we are guests. And not only that, but we would also expect protection. So a host has responsibility to provide for his guests protection. And again, we see some stories in the Old Testament in which this plays out. We could look at Genesis 19, for instance. Genesis 19, and that's the story of when the angels came and visited Lot. And they were there to get him out of the city, away from Sodom and Gomorrah. Because God is about to bring judgment upon those cities and destroy them from the face of the earth. And there the angels go. And if you remember that as the angels are there, as Lot is acting as host to them, the townsfolk come together and say, bring out those angels. We want to have our way with them. Bring out those men, right? They don't know that they're angels. Bring out those men. We want to have our way with them. And Lot has a responsibility to his guests to provide protection for them. Although if we know the story, how it unfolds, right? The angels are the one that provide protection to Lot and his family. Uh, they strike the men outside the door with blindness and they lead Lot and his family uh, out of the city. There's also another occasion in Judges 19. And this is another uh, horrifying situation we find. Judges 19 
uh, in which a Levite is traveling with his concubine. Uh, they go into uh, a city uh, in, in the land of Israel. Uh, they go into a town. Uh, one of the townsfolk there invites them into his house. And as this host is uh, entertaining his guests, again, the men of the village come and say, uh, send out that Levite. We want to have our way with him. And the host has a responsibility, again, to protect his guests to the point where he offers, uh, I think he offers his own daughter uh, as a way to assuage them, uh, but they don't want that. Eventually, the concubine, the Levite's concubine, gets sent out, and she is raped to death. And it kind of cascades this whole scenario, situation of judgment, of just, of just a terrible, you can see the moral degradation of Israel uh, during this time. And so, again, a host, though, has to protect his guests. And isn't this what God does here, right? Isn't the description here? Uh, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. God protects his people. Also, we should know who is it that the Lord is hosting? Who is the one that the Lord is hosting? And it's those who are his sheep, those who are his people, meaning that the blessings that we are thinking through here in this passage are not for everyone everywhere. So I know it's common in our culture to take a psalm like this, especially Psalm 23. We see it where? At funerals all the time. And you could see it at the funeral of a person who you know curse God to the very day of his death. And they'll pull out Psalm 23 and use it as this kind of uh, medication, this ointment to say everything's fine. God's going to bless him. He's going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. And that's not true. Right? The blessings of God are for the people of God. There is something to being called God's people. It is God's people that receive God's blessing, even though there may be common grace given to everyone, right? We looked at that before. The Lord makes the sun shine on the righteous and on the evil. He makes the rain fall on the righteous and on the evil. So, right, we know there's a, a, a level of common grace given to all men in various measures, but understand that the blessings of God, the blessings which David here is singing about, are only for God's people. That's it. The blessings of God are for God's people. And when we are God's people, that's an identity. And it means something. It changes how we live. Right? We can't forget what we studied in the book of Ephesians, which underscored that point greatly. Right? We could go to that masterful a work of the gospel in Ephesians 2 and see, right, that God has saved us by grace through faith and not of works. But being saved by grace through faith and not of works still results in a changed life. And Ephesians 2.10, that God has prepared good works for us who are his people to do. Or we could look at Ephesians 4, 17 and through 24. Ephesians 4, 17 through 24. And again, I want us to think about this. And, and again, the importance of this. Think about this. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. The blessings that we receive before the world are ours if we are in Christ. And if we are in Christ, we won't look like the world. Right? That's, that's this point here. Look at Ephesians 4, 17. Now this I say in testifying the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understand, understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. 
They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. Or do we understand that? So when I say the blessings of God are for God's people, what makes us God's people is God, right? He does that work in us. He saves us by grace through faith. But one of the evidences is that we are God's people is that we live differently, that there is a difference to us than the world around us. If we look like just like everyone else in the world that curses God, we should not expect the blessings of God. Right? That's fundamental. We have to understand this. So let's note, let's go through and note then in Psalm 23, verse 5, what are the blessings before the world? There's feasting. There's feasting. There's protection from enemies. And again, think about the audacity of this picture given to us here by David. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I'm sitting down and having a feast while all my enemies are looking at me with envy and anger and upset. How much the enemies of God's people must fear the host because they do nothing while we're sitting and feasting. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? They won't do anything against the people of God when God, the Lord, is there. And how must they writhe with displeasure and envy seeing the blessings of God being poured out on us, their enemies? I think there's something in here, too, which we'll get to in a few weeks of, as we begin to walk through uh, the book of Esther together. There's something in here of the time when Haman was forced to honor Mordecai, the Jew that he hated. Think about that. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and my enemies are the, the ones serving me. There's anointing with oil, and again, this is this is a gift not of necessity, but of pleasure. This is a gift of delight, right? This is not a gift of necessity. Food is necessary. Drink is necessary. But oil, what we're talking about here, this anointing with oil, this refreshing, this is, this is an overabundance, right? This is an extravagance. This is an extra. And what great thing is it, right? Fourthly, we have abundance, and not just abundance, but superabundance of drink. My cup overflows. And again, this brings us back to the book of Ephesians in chapter 3, verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. How rich is God's glory? And out of the riches of his glory, out of the abundance and superabundance of his glory, he gives us strength. Or we could look at Ephesians 3.20 when Paul's praying there. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, our cup overflows. So God provides and protects his people and we go back to that opening question, well, what are the blessings of God? Are they things material? Yes, they are. There are material things of life that God gives in blessing to his people. We could consider what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew about worry. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. Your great value 
You're of greater value than the birds of the air whom God feeds. You're of greater value than the grasses of the field which God clothes with beauty. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Does God give us, does God provide for us the necessities of life and even beyond the necessities of life? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. He richly provides. But we may ask, well, what about those who are in need? What about those who are poor among us? What about those who seem to not have the necessities of life? Are we to say perhaps that they don't have enough faith? Do they not trust God enough? And so that's why they're in need. No, I don't think we should say that. It could be the possibility, right? Again, we always go back, or I always go back to James 4. You do not have because you do not ask, right? The Israelites in the wilderness, when they were hungry and when they were thirsty, they grumbled and complained. What should they have done instead? Asked, right? Say, God, here we are in the wilderness. We're in the desert. We're thirsty. <coughs> we need water. And would God have provided if they had asked? Yes. How do we know that? Because God provided even when they didn't ask, right? When they grumbled and complained, God showed his glory and his goodness. So uh, is it that they don't have enough faith? I'm not saying that may be never the case, but I don't think that's predominantly the case. I think if we talk to our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in need, they would say, yes, we often pray for those things that we need, and it just never seems to come up. Although God does provide, if they're still breathing, God has prov provided something for them, right, to get them to that point. But sometimes God withholds the good pleasures of this life for his own purposes. And we have to understand that too. Paul says, right, I've learned to be content in whatever state I am, and whether that's in being filled or being hungry. And again, we've asked the question before, did Paul have faith in Christ and God to believe in the provisions that he needed? Yeah, absolutely, right? We have no doubt about that. And yet Paul still suffered hunger at times. We also have to understand that sometimes we don't have the things that we need or think we need because we are under the discipline of God, that God is trying to call our attention to issues which need to be addressed, to sin issues which need to be addressed in our hearts, to faithlessness that needs to be addressed. Uh, Moses says that about the people of Israel in the wilderness. God did these things to test your hearts, to see what was in them. Now, does God need to test to understand what is in our hearts? No, but God tests us so we understand what is in our hearts. So we need to trust in him. But you know what? It's more than just the material things that God blesses us with. So when we, when we look at Psalm 23, 5, we can interpret this as just material things, right? That God provides food, he provides protection, he provides uh, blessings and overabundance of goods and things in life. But it's more than just material things. It's, we can also interpret this symbolically, right? That these are things in which we will have feasting with Christ in heaven, Right. Do you realize that? Right? Are you looking forward to that day when you feast with Christ in heaven? Do you realize there's a great party getting prepared for? The guest list has gone out, and there are still people that need to respond. But they will, by God's grace. And he will bring them in from every corner of the earth, from north and south and east and west, to feast at Abraham's table. There's a feast coming, right? So, so we can th look at this more symbolically, right? This is something in the future, uh, even in the presence of enemies. Satan may look on in disgust from the pits of hell as the people of God are feasting in joy. And Satan will be able to do nothing about it, right? So we can look at these as, again, you know, in my head with oil. Maybe we think here of something of the Holy Spirit. Our cup overflows. Again, we have everything that we need for life and godliness. That's 2 Peter 1.3. And as we consider this further, you know, Calvin points out that this is David admonishing the rich of their 
of their responsibility. And what is the responsibility of the rich? What is their, might I say, what is our responsibility before God? We are to remember that it is the Lord who provides these things. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's the reality. When we have peace from our enemies, that is God's doing. When we have peace with God, right, that is Christ's doing. When we have provision enough and more than enough, that is reason for us to what? Give God thanks. Brothers and sisters, our duties before God, our responsibility before God as we receive his blessing is to thank him and to praise him. Do you thank God for that which you have? Do you thank God? Are you thankful to God for the things that you have? Or do you grumble and complain against him for the things that you don't? One of the dangers that God warned the people of Israel about as they entered into the promised land is when you get into the land and when you enjoy the streams flowing with milk and honey, don't think to yourself, I've done this. Haven't I done great? Let me just sit back and enjoy it. But always remember that any good thing that you have comes from the hand of the Lord. Every blessing that you have, whether a provision or protection, all that comes from the hand of the Lord. So give God thanks. But the blessing before the world is not the only blessing which David praises God for. Let's see next the blessings in light of eternity out of verse six, the blessings in light of eternity. And he begins verse six, surely or only or without a doubt, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. So what is David saying here? What is he singing? Goodness, we're talking about welfare. We're talking about prosperity or happiness. Again, this links back to verse 1, I shall not want. It links to verse 2, green pastures, still waters. It links to verse 3, he restores my soul, he refreshes my soul, right? Goodness, the goodness of God towards us. Mercy. Uh, this word mercy is in Hebrew, hesed, if you know what that word is. This is the covenantal love of God. This is steadfast love or loving kindness. Uh, I think typically in the ESV it's translated steadfast love. But this is that, this idea that those whom God has determined to love, he will love for how long? A couple weeks till we mess up. No, always. God always will love those whom he has determined to love. He will have mercy on those whom he will have mercy. He loves. And David here sings and confesses, right? Shall follow me all the days of my life. Matthew Henry puts it this way. Whom God loves, he loves to the end. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if God loves you, God loves you. Right? Do you understand what I'm saying? That if he loves you, his love does not waver for you like your love for him does. He loves you, and he will love you to the end, all the days of your life, till your final breath, the love of God will be present in your life if you are in Christ. Should we not praise God for that? Amen. Should we not thank him for that, right? 
even though we may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what does David say? I will fear no evil, for you are with me. God does not abandon us. He doesn't love us and say, oop, it, it's getting kind of tricky here. It's getting a little bit difficult. You're getting a little bit difficult. I'm done. No, those whom God has loved with covenant love, he will always love. And so David expresses this faith in God, right? This, that's what this is. Has David, is David dead yet? He is now, but is he when he's written this? No. So how does he know that God's goodness and mercy shall follow him all the days of his life? Because he trusts in God, right? He trusts in the word of God. He trusts in what God has said and done. He looks at his own life, wherever, whatever stage of life David may be in at, when he writes this, he looks at his life and says, God has been faithful to this point in my life. And you know what? I know it, know something about God. He's going to be faithful to the end of my life. God is going to provide for his people every good blessing. This is what David understands, and this is what we need to understand. This is whole orbed happiness and satisfaction in the Lord. Right? Not in the things of this world, not in his own strength and might, but in the Lord. He looks to the Lord. And we know that to be the case because look at what he says next. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. We can understand this differently. It could be that David's talking about something like attending public worship, right? He goes to the tabernacle and he partakes in public worship. But it could also be talking about him being a part of God's people. Today, which we call what? The church. Right? So this could be David saying, I will live in the Lord's house. I will be part of God's people. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we might even envision this as something of King David now in heaven, worshiping God in the heavenly temple. How long? For eternity. That David has in view here, this is my understanding, right? That David has in view here the glories of heaven in which he will behold God in his sanctuary to see his glory. Now this last word forever, uh, the New English translation uh, translates it this way, for the rest of my life. So if you look at that, you might say, well, that's very different than forever. And in Hebrew, it's more literally this, this word at the end that's we, that in English here is translated forever is literally length of days. So it could be that this is a parallel construction. It's often so in Hebrew uh, where the second phrase is kind of saying the same thing as the first phrase is uh, just in different using different language. So if it is about parallelism, right, then all the days of my life would make sense with for the rest of my life, for the length of days in verse, uh, at the latter part of verse 6. Um, we could look to, for instance, Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 30, verses 19 and 20. Deuteronomy 30, 19 and 20. And we see the same phrase again, so I want to read it for you just to Again, kind of give you understanding of what may be going on here. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. So Moses there speaking says, right, I've set before you life and death. I've set before you what? what the, the terms of the old covenant, the law, what God has given. And he says there, if you do these things, right, if you obey them, you're going to live long in the land. 
you're going to have length of days. So certainly, I think part of what Moses is describing, right, is the immediacy of a long earthly life. So David could equally be meaning here, right, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for all of my life. Like, I, I will be in the presence of God and worshiping him for as long as I live. But do we think that David and Moses both just thought that all that there was is this earthly life? No, I think we both understand Right? We understand that both of them know that there's more to this life than just this earthly life, right? that there's something that is after this life. We could look, for instance, to what David says uh, about when his child uh, that he had with Bathsheba dies. He says, you know, I, I can't go. That, that child can never come back to me, but I will go to him. And so there's, again, some kind of intimation there that there's something more than just the immediacy. And I think Moses believes that there. There's also here spoken of eternity. What's interesting, we have Jesus say in Luke 20, Luke 20, verses 37 and 38, Jesus talks about what Moses believes. Also, do we think that Jesus knows what Moses believes? Yeah. Luke 20, 37 and 38. Uh, some had come to him, uh, the Sadducees, basically arguing there is no resurrection. And so Jesus responds, Luke 20, 37, But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Right, so... Jesus is there saying that Moses understood that there's more to life than just a long earthly life. Or we could look to Paul's words to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. So God's blessing of his people. So, so if we go back here and we say, well, David means only about his earthly life, that he's going to dwell in the house of the Lord. And that word forever there shouldn't really be translated forever. Let's say that's the case. But what we do know is that David understood there's more to this life. Moses understood that there's more to this life. Faithful followers of God from eternity past, right? From the very beginning of creation, understood that there was more to this life than the earthly life we now live. So God's blessings of his people do not stop at their death. God's blessing of his people do not stop at their death. That's part of the purpose of Christ's coming, isn't it? To defeat death, to kill death, so that we as believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ, from ancient past to distant future can sing this. Death, oh death, where is your sting? Right? Do we believe that? Do we understand that? That the blessings of God are not just material blessings, but they're also immaterial. That they extend into eternity. And I believe David's point here is that he's going to live out the Aaronic blessing from number six. That the face of the Lord will be upon him. That God will lift up his countenance upon him and give him rest. Not just earthly rest, not just rest from his enemies of this earth, but rest from the enemies to, of all enemies, right? Rest from Satan, the evil one. He will dwell in the good presence of God and will enjoy the benefits of the blessings of God, not just now, although certainly now. By the way, we might just ask, what better state, what better uh, life could a person have? So the Lord richly blesses his people now and for all eternity. And brothers and sisters, what are the correct response to God's blessings? Thanksgiving. Brothers and sisters, I don't know if you thank God. And your daily life for that which he has given to you. But you need to thank God every day for the blessings which he has given to you. 
I know there may be things in your life that are not what they should be. You may have physical ailments that God has not relieved you of. They may be a thorn in your flesh that aggravates you. But thank God for his grace towards you. And we need to praise God, right? We need to praise God. God is good. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Right? We need to praise God for that. We need to praise God for who he is, for his goodness, for his steadfast love, for his provision and protection. Now, as those are the things we ought to do, what are the things that we are more likely to do or are tempted to do? Probably gum grumble and complain about the things that we don't have. Let us confess that our heart is quicker to jump to, God, I don't have this. Then our heart is quicker to jump to, God, thank you for this. Brothers and sisters, let us confess that we grumble and complain against God, although we may not recognize it as such. The people of Israel grumbled and complained against Moses not realizing that right what they're really grumbling who they are really grumbling and complaining against is not Moses but God so sometimes we do that right we grumble and complain against our spouse they're not giving us what we need but are we really grumbling against them or are we grumbling against the God that gave us our spouse let us confess our sins before God we're also tempted I think to faithlessness right? God's not going to provide. Again, the Israelites are instructed for us, right? Why did God give us the first five books of the Bible? Why did God give us the book of Judges? To show us that we're, that's the temptation of our hearts, is to say, God's not going to provide for us. He brought us out here to kill us. We have to confess this as well. We have to confess that we may believe, but Lord, help our unbelief. We may believe that God will provide, but then we do everything in our life to show, to prove as evidence that we do not really believe. Right? When, when circumstances come our way that is difficult, do we trust that God will provide? Or do we start examining what we need to do to fix the situation? Do we pray to God and ask him, Lord, would you provide in this situation? Or is our first thought, well, let me get out my pen here and my paper and let's let's do let's make a ch checklist here and this is what we need to do 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 ch -ch -ch. now maybe we do need to make a checklist we have to be responsible right god gives us work to do work is a good gift from god work existed before sin entered the world do you realize that so work is a good gift from god it's made difficult by sin so sometimes we do need to do work. However, do we trust God? In all this, do we have faith in God? Do we say, God, this is what I believe. This is what I, what I think you are leading me to do, that you've equipped me to do, that you've provided for me to do. But Lord, provide what I need. And if it's by the means of my own hands that you're going to deliver that into my hands, then let me be faithful to that. But again, what are we trusting in? Again, we could go to the book of James. Let me go to this city and I'm going to make this and such and such a prophet. What is your life? Rather say, if the Lord wills, I will go here and do this or that. I think we're also tempted to thank, thanklessness. Thanklessness. So when we are enjoying the blessings of God, we don't thank him for them. Again, the sin of the Israelites. They're there for our instruction. They're there for our warning. We need to thank God to acknowledge that he is where the blessings come from. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Right? And we should do that every day. And what are the blessings of God for his people? We know that they are 
There are temporal things right there. There are material things. There's food. There's shelter. There's clothing. Praise God for those things. Thank God for those things. But more than that, there are also eternal, eternal things which God blesses us with. Eternal life. The forgiveness of our sins. All these things. And I think as a church, one of the things we need to ask is, does our corporate time together reflect the realities of the blessings of God on his people? And what I mean by that is, do we as a church acknowledge, not just me as a pastor, but all of us, right? Do we acknowledge that it is God who is the source of our blessings? Is that your heartbeat right now? Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Because it's not just about what I think and do as a church. It's all of us. What is our heartbeat? What do we emphasize? Is it good to come to the house of the Lord? Not just, should it be good? That's not the question I ask. Yes, it should be good to come to the house of the Lord together. But is it good? Does thankfulness flow from our lips? And this is something we probably all can confess and say, not as much as it should. But let us strive to do better as a church. There are those who I know who uh, claim for themselves the blessings of God. And what they mean by that is just the temporal blessings. That's all they care about. Right? They want their best life now. There are whole industries of Christianity that, that think that way. And if all you care about is having your best life now, if that's all you care about, if that's all your concern is, if, if that's all God is to you, is how can he give me what I want today now? then you are missing the most important of God's blessings. And realize, too, because sometimes we forget this, that it is within the power of Satan to give, to provide things of this world. Surely that's what he meant when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, right? What did Satan say to him? Just bow down and worship me, Jesus. And all these kingdoms, all their power, all their wealth, all their glory will be yours. Because it's within my power to give them to you. So say, so Jesus, just, just say, praise Satan. Just say that little phrase, and this will be yours. So if he could so tempt Jesus with that, don't think that he can't also give to others those same powers and glories. So not all the blessings that we receive in life may come from the hand of God. They may come through the hand of Satan to destroy us. And you must answer the question for yourself, where do the blessings of God come from? Right? Where do the blessings that I have come from? There is much in our culture, and again, even within so-called churches, so-called pastors, that would say that the blessings of God are for everyone. Everyone receives what David is here talking about. Everyone gets that because God loves everyone, and he loves everyone equally, and he loves everyone, right? He's going to give to everyone everything because he, that's what he is. He's a God of love, and that's all that matters. But understand that, that that is false. Because, yes, God is merciful, but God is also wrathful. And he will pour out his wrath on all unrighteousness, on all wickedness. And though they may point to a verse like this and say, well, look, see the blessings of God, look, goodness and mercy are going to follow you all the days of your life. 
That's only true if the Lord is your shepherd. The blessings of God are for the people of God. And you don't become part of the people of God by rights, by inheritance, by purchasing it, by working for it. You become God's people by the Lord being your shepherd. How do you do that? Well, the shepherd calls his sheep and they know his voice and they follow after him. So do you hear the voice of the shepherd calling? Can you hear him? Turn to the Lord. Confess your sins. Say, God, forgive me of the evils that I have committed against you. And maybe the evil is even right here before us, right? God, forgive me for the thanklessness that I have evidenced throughout my life. No matter how long it's been, Lord, that, that you have given good things, that you have given good gifts, that you have given every good and perfect gift. And I have used it for my own selfishness. And I have not thanked you as I should have thanked you. Pray that to God. Say, God, forgive me and repent. Right? Turn from those things. Turn from your self-sufficiency. Recognize that indeed the blessings of God come from God himself and nothing less. And call out to Christ. Say, Christ, be my Lord. Christ, be my shepherd. And wherever he leads, I'll go. Let us pray. The great Father in heaven, we pray that you would forgive us for grumbling and complaining about your good gifts. Forgive us for failing to thank you for the blessings that you've given unto us, the provisions. Father, forgive us for the ways in which we have failed to acknowledge you. And Lord, we thank you. We do thank you, Lord. We thank you from, from our very souls this morning. We thank you for the blessings that you have granted unto us. Father God, we thank you for the blessings that you have granted unto us, even as, as a church body here, that you have given unto us this building. And that you have begun to work so many things out in so many different ways that, that we can't even fathom. Because you're able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. Father, forgive us for such small thoughts of you. And Lord, we praise you that indeed you are love. And that in the greatness of your love, you give. Out of the bounty of your goodness, you give. And that we can sing with David. We who confess Christ as Lord, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of our lives, not just here on this earth, but for all eternity. Father God, we, we confess that we can't even conceive of the ways in which you will provide for us in eternity future. Father, we thank you for the word that gives us hints to that. What glories await your people? But Father, be praised in us. As you bless us, we thank you. And Father, we pray for those in our midst that you would give them ears to hear and eyes to see. Lord, that they would know Jesus. They would confess him as Lord. Have mercy, O God. We pray in the name of our only Lord, Jesus. Amen.